Hello everyone. I've made a 2.4 GHz wireless bootloader for my 6502 single board computer. Simply put, it lets me write and assemble code on my desktop and send it to real hardware and run it without doing this a thousand times a day. Instead, sending the code wirelessly only takes a literal second. I've made this uh, using common NRF24 LO1 Plus compatible uh, 2.4 GHz radio transceivers that I control by simply bitbanging SPY on the 6502 side. This takes advantage of the fact that I already have a 3 volt regulator on the single board computer and the radio module is 5 volt tolerant except for the supply pins. On the desktop side I write the assembly code in a text editor and then run a script that assembles it with CA65 and then just sends it to the 6502. However, since my desktop Mac Mini is missing GPIO pins for some reason, I've attached the radio module to a Raspberry Pi that I'm already using for home automation with a simple breakout board of my own design. The breakout board isn't strictly necessary, but it's very convenient and it improves stability a lot because it has the 10 microfarad capacitor that these modules are missing. I use these modules for a lot of different things because they're cheap, efficient, and much lower power than the ESP8266, for instance. The Raspberry Pi has a simple C++ program that splits the binary file into chunks that the radio module on the 6502 can accept. From there, it's a simple matter of uploading the code and controlling the Pi via SSH key-based authentication. Uh, does this mean that I figured out secure wireless transfer with these modules? No, absolutely not. As Microsoft and Logitech previously found out, this protocol is about as secure as writing your messages on slightly damp wood and expecting that that'll pe keep people from reading it. If you use these modules, then expect everything you send to be out in the open. In this case, we can call it open source or open machine language. You know what I mean. It should be obvious there is an advantage to getting the code to the 6502 faster and without the mechanical strain of continually removing and inserting the ROM in the sockets. You might still ask why I don't just use serial since that might actually be error appropriate. And I guess I don't really consider this cheating any more than using a flat panel instead of a CRT or a modern mechanical keyboard or using a Mac to write the code for that matter. Everyone draws the nostalgia line differently, and in this case, the fun and convenience of interfacing a modern chip outweighs the error correctness. On the other hand, I decided to make the single board computer NMOS 6502 compatible, even though it would have been much less complicated to only support the CMOS 65C02s. I chose to do the extra work mostly for nostalgia reasons. So I don't know how many people are interested in a walkthrough of the source code, but uh, I guess there's only one way to find out. So here goes. Um, I borrowed this subroutine from this blog that you can find in the source. Uh, the source is on GitHub, of course. And I've got the radio module connected to port B. But I also have these uh, middle bits that I'm not using for, for spy. So I'm saving those to a temporary uh, location here. Then I push the registers to the stack, then I clear Y, and I clear the input bytes, and then I load X with 8 because we're going to be looping through uh, each bit of the byte we're sending out and getting in at the same time. So in the beginning we clear A, then we shift the output byte left, so the most significant bit goes into the carry. And depending on that, we, uh, we either set the output bit to 1, or just move straight to setting the, the save bits, and then saving it to the via, and saving it to port B. We started with a clock low, then we clear A here for delay reasons, it says. And then we increment the VN to set the clock bit to a 1. Then we clear the carry, and then we check the input bit, and we save that to the input byte. 
by uh, by setting the carry and then rotating left so it's uh, it comes in on the on the right side then we toggle the, the clock back to zero we decrement X and then we loop all over and then we do that eight times and we end up with the input byte in B that we copy to the accumulator this subroutine right here RF not is what I use to get the status byte from the radio module the data sheet uh, says that you can load it with uh, FF if you just want to do nothing while getting the status byte but of course uh, technically anything will do because the module always uh, puts out the status byte when writing any uh, any command so it's pretty easy to, to get the status byte anyway um, then I store that and then I set the chip select high again and that's how uh, the knob works reading and writing to the module is uh, taken care of by this subroutine right here it takes the command in X and a command is basically the the register in the module you want to address along with uh, a read or a write bit and the data in the accumulator and the incoming byte is uh, returned in the accumulator as well so we start by pushing the, the data byte to the stack because we don't need it right now and then we set the chip select low we transfer uh, the X register to the accumulator because that contains the, the command or the address along with the read or write bit and while we're shifting that out we also get the status register uh, incoming so we can save that to RAM then we pull the data byte from the stack and we ship that out with the spy byte uh, subroutine we get a return value in the accumulator we can push that to the stack then we can set the chip select high again and then A has the return value. The init RF24 uh, subroutine here is responsible for initializing the module on reset or if something goes wrong. So basically we start by flushing the input buffer. We use the read write register subroutine to, to do that with the command in X, the data in A. Then we clear the the RX interrupt, you can see here we're writing because we are basically oring 2007. That's why we that's how we make this command. Then we load the mask into the A and we send that. Then we set the feature, the DINDP register, and then we power up the module and we're ready to receive. Uh, right when we set the, the CE pin high on the module. Uh, you might notice that I'm not actually setting up any addresses here and that's uh, because I'm using it so simple that I'm actually just using the uh, the, the default addresses uh, which is the super easy way to get started as long as all of these are configured the same on the Raspberry Pi and on the module here. The read RF24 regs uh, subroutine is uh, basically a debugging thing because all it does is it takes the, the 32 registers and then it loops through them and saves them to uh, to zero page so they're easy to find um, that makes it easy because i can just press f1 on the computer and it'll show me whatever it read in the config registers of the of the module The get message subroutine we use when we know from the status register there's a, a message waiting for us. So first we start out by getting the input buffer length and then we save that to address 81 which would be where the the payload length from the from the debugging function up here uh, would be stored. Then we can set the chip select low then we send the command to to read the payload we uh, save the status byte here and then we start looping over the amount of bytes stored in uh, in hex 81 the address here and then we save the 32 bytes uh, maximum to address 90 and above 
Then we set the chip select high again, and we can clear the RX interrupt. And then we're done. And that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it for the subroutines to talk to the module. But at the beginning, I said that um, this is an actual wireless bootloader for my 6502 uh, single board computer here. And uh, that's exactly what it is. So after the, the welcome message, which we can call the, the BIOS in this case, um, I check if there's actually uh, a radio module connected. And then if there is, we jump to check if uh, we receive the message. Then if the interrupt is set in the status byte, we go to get message here. Basically, first, we uh, got to remember to disable interrupts because if we get interrupted in the middle of receiving a, a byte, then it's not going to look very good on the other end. Um, so after that, we get the, the first message. And hopefully that is uh, a control message, which will tell us how many bytes are in um, are in the file we're trying to receive. Then we print out how many bytes we're supposed to be receiving in total, and then we move on to getting the data packets. When moving on to checking the data packets, first we check if it's uh, actually the control package we're parsing first. Then we set the the size byte in RAM, and we also set the save pointer, which starts at address 0, 0300. So we uh, we always save the the program to the same uh, same place in RAM. Then we parse all the remaining packets starting at uh, byte number two, and we just copy that from where the the guest message subroutine saves. The, the incoming packet, and then we copy that to the correct place in RAM. Then along the way, we uh, print how many bytes are left, and we make sure that uh, we, we overwrite the same place on the screen, because we don't want to just spam the screen with how many bytes are left. And then when we're done, we reset the, the keyboard read and write pointers in case somebody pressed a, a key during uh, reception. We reset the, the line, basically a uh, carriage return new line here. And then we print out how many bytes are left one last time. And then we inform the user that data has been loaded into RAM at address 0, 0300. And you can press F5 or type run to start executing the program. And that's all there is to it. The program you saw at the beginning of the video is uh, this user land that asks file here. Basically it's importing the print immediate function from the ROM, then we're just activating C style string escapes. So we can do stuff like backslash n here for a new line. Uh, it's very, very simple. Basically all it does is printing some text and then it's running the branch CO2 here. Because since the the NMOS uh, 6502 doesn't have the branch uh, instruction, it'll just fall through and then print I'm an NMOS 6502 and then jump to exit. But if it actually does have the branch instruction, it'll continue from here and print Hi, I'm a CMOS 65 CO2, and then finish and return to main. I have uh, programmed my interrupts, so a break actually uh, goes back to the, the reset vector without resetting the RAM. So this is how I designed a wireless bootloader for my 6502 single board computer. This way I can simply change the user land file and run the upload script rather than writing the physical ROM IC every time I change my program. In this video, I only walked through the code directly related to the wireless bootloader, and the video is plenty long already. If you would like to see me walk through more of the firmware code, like how I made a blinking cursor, the monitor program itself, or how I handle interrupts, then make sure to put that in the comment for this video. I hope you liked the video, and if you have any feedback, positive as well as negative, I would very much appreciate a comment. In a future video, I expect to give a thorough walkthrough of the hardware in revision 1 of my single board computer. 
Spoilers include that it's a much smaller board than the first version since I managed to get rid of the now unobtainium paddock microcontroller I used to generate sync signals and replace it with 7400 series logic and that is even without increasing the chip count. Other ideas I'm working on right now include a fantastically era-appropriate tape interface using a reel-to-reel -reel tape quarter from 1972 so I can save programs the genuine 70s way. After that, I will probably start working on a sound card of some sort. I will most likely try several different sound generator chips like the General Instruments 8910A, the Yamaha OPL or OPL2 chip, maybe the Philips 1099, and maybe even the SID chip of the Commodore 64. Once again, the question is whether I stay in the 70s or take a sneak peek at the 80s. Future videos might also include 8-bit color graphics, because 256 colors look better than two, but uh, feel free to let me know what you would like to see the most. If you would like to make a 6502 computer like mine, then check out the links in the description. There you'll find link to the KiCad files, the Gerbers, and the source code, as well as some credits for this video. Thanks for watching.